So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to talk about algorithmic architecture, real-time AI, which obviously from the keynote this morning we know should be machine learning. We shouldn't call it AI, but that's okay. And the search for alpha, where alpha is the ability to find trading opportunities, for example, in the stock market. So this is a, a real example of, of stuff that we've been working on. So a little bit of an introduction um, to myself very quickly. So I'm an engineer by background, so I'm one of the guys who put my hand up this morning and said I'm a developer. Um, that's my background. I'm not a data scientist. Um, so what I'm talking about is really my experiences in moving into this space, uh, working with uh, data scientists. So um, I have a PhD in adaptive framework design uh, for high-performance systems. And I spent a lot of time with the C++ community, so apologies to anybody who's a Java developer or anything that's not C++. You're actually still quite good developers, so don't worry about it. Um, now, in terms of, I've done a bit of Python. Python's brilliant, especially in our space, okay? Um, I, a lot of time in the Agile space, that's kind of the thing that's interested me. I did a fork of track. Um, so what really I care about is how people and come together to develop complex systems and, and what can we learn from that experience and how can we apply that to building better, more, more interesting systems. So back in, I guess, 2007, just on the cusp of the financial crisis, I found myself at the NYSE and I was there through the financial crisis and then through the flash crash in 2010. And what's interesting about this event, and we see this recurring in a lot of places, is that this event change the banking crisis from a banking crisis into a technology crisis. So what happened was we all thought, oh, people are screwing this up, and then suddenly we thought, well, actually, hold on, machines running algorithms, can I actually screw this up instead? And in fact, they can do a better job than humans because they wiped over two trillion off the markets in two minutes and 40 seconds, which I think is quite an impressive feat, which is actually the GDP of you know, it's more than the G GDP of most European countries. So, yeah, that, that was very impressive. Now, I did recover, so that wasn't too bad. And in the back of that, I got involved with the SEC, the investigation, because my systems were part of that problem. And um, although we were innocent, obviously. So what we found was that there are a lot of issues where people didn't... So it became clear that the regulators and the general, the markets didn't actually understand the impact technology could have. And that was a profound thing. So I actually set up a company called Clearpool, and that's what we do. We, we build systems that address those issues. And in that journey, I got involved with a startup called Yetup. And what Yetup do is they, uh, they were two data scientists who essentially founded a company, and they thought, well, how hard could it be to write a proof-of-concept system that would actually allow us to analyze all of social media, and then we could trade against it and make lots of money? Um, but, but actually, they had done some really profound work um, in that area. So I got involved with them, and we started to build a, an actual system that could do that. And more recently, I've got involved with a company called uh, TPI Cap. I uh, don't know if any of you have heard of that. So TPI Cap are an IDB, which means interdealer broker. And what they do is they broker trades between investment banks. So pretty much anything that doesn't trade on an organized venue, like, a, like an exchange or something, goes through an IDB. So they underpin, for example, most of the world's economy, the, the world's largest IDB. So a lot of my background is in the finance space, so this is what interests me. So this is, this is kind of where I'm going to focus this talk today. So a bit of a backstory. So, yet up. So as I said, they, like any startup, they're small, new, started off with a POC. Um, again, how hard could it be? Um, next, you know, someone's going to come up and say, I have an idea for making money. I'll make a website that will sell advertising if people search put search terms in, but obviously it's harder than it is in the, in the real world. So they had a bit of a journey. I got involved with them. Again, I said, I don't, don't use Java, use C++. But that's actually because um, we wanted to build a real-time low-latency system, and that's where we had expertise, so that's what we focused on. Um, introduced the guys to the software community at Jax Finance. They uh, had agreements with uh, tw uh, Twitter and StockTwits. They actually achieved a really big thing, and they actually signed a limited release with one of the world's largest independent market makers. I don't know if you know what a market maker is, but a market maker is a, is a company that essentially takes both sides of a trade. They actually provide the liquidity that helps the, the markets um, work today as we know it. And then we obviously did a lot of coding. And suddenly something happened. We realized that uh, 
people don't actually trade in, for example, 20 instruments at a time. They trade in very substantial portfolios. So a small portfolio might be 500 financial instruments. So imagine if you're trying to build an AI system that tracks one financial instrument. That's actually quite hard in and of itself. So 20, mm, that's okay. You could just throw a few more, you know, a bit, bit more RAM at it and so on. Um, but 500, that's a totally different order of magnitude. So this is kind of where we got to. Anyway. Uh, moving on, they got some awards. We then spoke a little bit about the progress that had been made at the next Jack's Finance, um, which is a sister conference to this one. Um, and we then went live. We actually secured some, fun some funding for the, the project, which is brilliant. And we actually did a lot of analysis which showed very good results. So, of course, the first thing the guy said, if I'm putting all this money in, uh, why don't we just trade ourselves? Why, why are we trying to sell this to other people? Because if we trade ourselves, obviously, then we can make uh, lots and lots of money. Um, and if it were that easy, I probably wouldn't be here. So, but here I am at the uh, ML conference, so happy to be here. And I'm going to talk through some of the journey as to uh, around this and the systems and, and how we would build these. So the basic problem is we want to trade against signals derived from social media. This is what Yetup was, this is what the remit was. So when we think about social media, we think about it in different ways. So we, it's, it's essentially a new language, okay? Um, there's people, people can't spell on social media. I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, so... This is, this is one of the problems um, that you face. So those are actually new words, just in case you're wondering. Um, it's constantly growing, and there was some research done that showed that 1,500 new words and phrases appear in the global conversation every day. And if you do the math, that's actually quite a lot, right? So um, it means that it's changing constantly, um, which is the next point. Um, so in order to make sense of it, you need to have an idea of your, your domain. You have to understand what your domain is, and you need to be... Uh, you need to have a way to, to do that adaptation. So, of course, we're all at a machine learning conference, so we can see where this is going, um, but it's not easy, okay? So, but what is it really? I mean, what, what is social media really? And uh, <laughs> don't, don't answer that, please, right? <laughs> um, so, what we're saying is that it's essentially a whole bunch of people, systems, whatever it might be, because um, there's bots and so on, right? And they're putting all this information onto you know, Twitter, StockTwits, Facebook, and so on. And then other people, such as yourselves, then, then consume that. And what Yetup, of course, want to do is they want to put their systems at the end of this, pull out some information and say, okay, I have detected that um, you know, something profound, like uh, there's an emissions scandal for a Volkswagen, therefore the, the stock price is going to drop. Okay, so, you know, that's interesting. But what we're really saying is that this is an information channel. Now, it turns out that Twitter is probably the primary channel that you would want to be interested in. And the reason for that is that the world and his wife scrapes everything else and dumps it onto Twitter. And Twitter happens to be a very succinct way to capture information. Um, so Twitter as a primary channel is probably your, your, your starting point in any exercise like this. But obviously, you're welcome to go to stock tweets, Facebook, whoever, right? Um, now, to give you an idea of scale, um, Twitter uh, has the last numbers that I checked, and that wasn't too long ago. It's approximately 550 million tweets per day. So, I mean, does, does anybody think that's a lot? Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, that's across the whole world, right? Um, so that is an average rate of 6.4 thousand tweets per second. Now, in financial terms, um, that's actually a tiny amount of information. And the reason why that's a tiny amount of information, well, I say that there's a lot of information in there, there's a lot of noise. In financial terms, let's say you had uh, 20 highly liquid stocks in the US markets. You might be having to process on, on a very busy day, for example, up to, say, a million quotes per second. So that becomes a big data problem for you very, very fast. This here, not so much. Now, the thing is that what we want to do is we want to trade on this so we actually don't have a lot of raw information because it turns out, and this might be a rumor, but I have heard that about 90% of what's on things like Twitter is actually garbage. So I don't know if that's true, but if it is, that's a very low signal to noise ratio, right? So, um, so this, th th this, is, this is an issue. So we need to find a way to address that. Um, and it means that whatever models we build, however we analyze this, we need to be very, very good at it or else we're just going to be uh, reacting to, to, to nonsense. 
So what we're aiming for, and this is a, this is a very, very superficial statement, we're, we're, we're aiming for the ability to be real time because we're saying that we don't have a lot of information but time is money in the markets right so if you have a piece of news if you react first you earn money this is where the high frequency trading comes in at a very basic level they want to trade faster than anybody else you get down to you know nanosecond latencies and all this kind of stuff which is a whole different world than this one um, but the point is you want to be real time you're not necessarily having to process a whole lot but when we actually start to look at the process and you require it is actually a whole lot um, we needed to be adaptive, for sure. We wanted to be language agnostic, but actually that's very, very hard. And you need to understand language to a minimum degree to be able to then bring to play your language agnostic capabilities. So for example, we have some capabilities in this area, but in order to utilize them, you still need to understand all the languages that you can then apply your language agnostic features to. Um, so it's, it's a hard one to crack. And the domain aware aspect, that's something you kind of hard code because what you do is you say, well, I'm in finance, therefore I'm going to build my context, my structure, my models around finance, and I'm done, right? Now, obviously, you can write code in an intelligent way so that you can move into, say, for example, political analysis, which would be an interesting one. Um, but for us, we're, we're focused on really these, these two up, up above. So, so when you use a channel, there's really two things you can do. You can know what you want to hear, and you can listen for that, right, which is very, very simple. Or you can say, well, I actually don't know exactly what I want to hear, but do you know what? When I see it, I will know what that is. And it turns out that in terms of alpha and trading, that's actually where the money is. It's in the second one. So right away, we can see that hard coding stuff and, and looking for specific things isn't going to be that helpful. Now, we'll get you so far, right? But, but ultimately, this is what, what we, we care about. So again, this, this adds to the complexity. Now, we also care about what was said. So we need to be able to look at, and, and I'm sure a lot of you, I mean, how, how many people here have done sort of sentiment type analysis work? I guess is a few of you, right? Um, so you, or natural language processing, any of that kind of stuff. So you're, you're looking at trying to do things like, you know, look at a, a sentence, understand what the subject is, what the object is, pull out the nouns, all that kind of stuff, right? So that's, you know, what was actually said? What was it about? So what's the actual topic? What, what, are, we, what are we talking about? We need to try and figure this out. And then lastly, we want to perhaps have a view on the opinion that has been expressed, right? So is it good or bad? It was indifferent, and that's actually hard to do. You know, there's a lot of companies that have been doing this for a number of years. I think um, there's, I, I think there's, I saw one company. I think uh, Sentience, maybe someone's given a talk on that. Is, is the guy in the room? No. Oh, yeah. So I mean, there's a lot of good work being done on this by by other people. That's not something we're looking too much on. So another thing is, well, who said what was said? That's another thing. Um, who cared about what was said? And has anyone said this before? Now, there's many, many more. Um, aspects of this that you could start to look at. The, the point being that the understanding of the message is only a very, very small part because what we're dealing with here is an information channel and what we care about is how the information moves through that channel. That's actually almost more valuable than the information itself. So again, that's, that's an interesting um, takeaway. Now, we talked about hard coding the domain aspects, so we said this is financially driven. So we want to understand, okay, in terms of the companies, what well, how do we classify the companies? How do we name the companies? So uh, apparently there's a, there's a car maker um, called BMW, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, that's been around for quite a while. And there's many different ways that we can refer to that in social media, right? So or in any conversation. So we can use its, its proper name. We can use its abbreviations. We can use some of the slangs or very common slangs. We can actually misspell the slangs if we want to. Um, but all of these things are triggers to tell us that whatever messages we're looking at have a relevance to, for example, this company. Now, if that's all we had to do, that would be fairly simple. You could get a few people to sit and manually pull all this together. And, and actually, that's probably what you would do for most of this stuff. If you had a stock universe of 500 instruments, you would probably manually do this because it doesn't change very often. Why, why would you invest a lot of time trying to discover that information? You, you kind of know what it is. You know, quick Google search will get you most of these things. Um, and that's okay, but it gets more complicated because the value in what we do with trading is we have to understand the relationships between what we see today in, for example, uh, 
so, so uh, let, let's say a, a company called Volkswagen um, has an emissions scandal. Um, will that impact other motor manufacturers that build diesel cars? I don't know, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. So what we want to do is we want to look at how we classify the instruments. And this is some of these are classifications that are used within finance. Some of these are classifications that are just uh, general classifications that economic, uh, economists would use. Um, but the idea is that there are a lot of different relationships and we can see that companies in the same sector, for example, might have an influence on others. So for example, Rio Tinto, um, is involved in mining, so if there's some problem with mining in, in, in some part of Africa, that may impact the competitors either positively or negatively, depending on what that news is. So all of this information needs to be correlated. So suddenly our universe of 500 stocks now has become a universe of several thousand levels where information appears at different levels within various trees. And we need to track all of those independently, but also correlate between them. So you can start to see that what we're trying to build gets very, very complex. We also, sorry, um, that just happened to be the first thing to come up. Sorry if I've offended anyone. So what, uh, what we also want to do is we want to pick out information about various topics. For example, has somebody very prominent made a statement? For example, Donald Trump. Um, has there been... Uh, you know, an incident like exploding washing machines. So I think, I, I can't remember the story exactly, but I believe um, earlier on in the year, someone tweeted that their washing machine had blown up. There was a picture of it. It happened to be, I, whether it was a Samsung or some other company. But the bottom line was that um, this went viral and it actually impacted the uh, stock market price. So, you know, these, these things happen. What you find about this is that some of these things are transient. Some of these things come and go. So these are things that we don't know. So the, the, the really valuable things are the things that uh, comes in that second category. I know, what I, I, know, I know what it is when I see it. Other things are things that happen all the time in companies. For example, uh, reports about company performance, mergers and acquisitions. So you can be specifically looking for information on those things because we know that those things will always happen. Now, obviously, there are many, many of these topics, so many, in fact, that we probably can't figure out what they are. So we need a way to learn and discover these over time. And obviously, some of these become stale very quickly and so on and so forth. So... Um, here, thinks AI is probably a good, uh, a good way to deal with this. Um, we thought so, which is why we started to do this. And in fact, it was more that uh, the, guy, the, the guys that I was involved with, uh, that, that this is the nature of the work they were doing. They saw that what they could do could maybe be applied to this. But I think anyone you know, with any sense would see that if you want to build an adaptive system that has to learn from its environment, this is an example of, of one of those systems. So... Conceptually, we can think about this as a pipeline, right? So we can say that, uh, you know, at a very superficial level, if we, want to, if we wanted to build a system that would do this, we would have a receiver that would read from an API, probably some JSON messages, we would do some categorization, probably some semantic classification, some machine um, classification, some feature analysis, and then we would pull out some fantastically useful information that will tell us that if you buy... Um, you know, 100 shares in BMW, you'll make lots of money. Um, and then people could, could work with this. Now, the idea, of course, of this is that you don't tell people to buy and sell stock. What you do instead is you create information that allows people to reason about that information in the context of other market data. So, for example, real pricing information, whatever, whatever people trade with ordinarily. And that's what the add up um, play is supposed to be. Now, of course, we also know, because we're in this space, that there's probably a whole bunch of models here. And what we would like to do is we would like to use this to update our semantic classifiers. So if we do that, then, of course, we we'd probably have some lexicons in here. We could actually update the, the lexicons. Um, so we'll have some adaptive lexicons, which would help us identify and, you know, clusters around topics, right? So now we can start to identify topics. And then that could actually update our filter rules because what we don't do is we don't connect to all of Twitter, right? I mean, Twitter won't sell you that um, anyway. Or if they do, it's very, very expensive. So what you might do is take a statistical subsample of Twitter, for example, the Decahose, and then you might explicitly search and try and pull down data from very specific um, aspects of that. So... The real problem then is, is, is not that. The real problem is actually building this real-time adaptive system that can actually be used for trading. And that was the one thing that um, I kind of skipped over. As, as I said, we went from, let's 
produce a signal so someone else can trade to let's produce a signal that allows us to trade. And if you are familiar with trading, you'll know that there's two very profound differences between those. In one of them, you take on absolutely zero risk, but you get to charge people for the time of, you know, for, for money for them to take on risk themselves to trade. But in the other case, you actually take on your own risk. So now your system has to be robust, reliable, it, it has to be able to fail over, it has to be able to restart, all kinds of stuff that you don't need to worry about so much if you're just sending out a signal. So, um, sorry, we should go back. So, so this is the real problem. So. I don't know if any, if, if, if any of you are familiar with um, organizational theory. Um, so in 1974, Russell Ackoff, who was an organizational theorist, said that we fail more often because we solve the wrong problem than because we get the wrong solution to the right problem. Now, the reason why we care about this is because we're about to embark on an activity here of building a, a, arguably a highly complex system that needs to have adaptivity, it needs to be real time, it has to deal with hard constraints and so on and so forth. And it's very, very easy to get that wrong. And to get it right, we actually have to understand a little bit more about what we're trying to chew off here. So question is, do we understand problems? Now, this, this stuff is a quick crash course in some of the theory behind this, um, which we'll then pull it back later. Um, but we can classify problems as uh, tame. So th these are sort of proper terms. And a tame problem actually doesn't mean it's simple. It could be a highly complex problem. Um, but the key thing is there's a definitive stopping point. And we also know how to proceed with the problem. So what we can do is we can say, okay, well, I, I can see this. It's, it's actually really, really complicated, but actually I know how to deal with that because I've done this before. And it can be broken down into parts and solved. So it's a divide and conquer um, approach will work, for example. And you can determine whether you're successful or not. So when you're done, you can say, well, actually, I'm finished. So what's interesting about these kind of problems is that they naturally fit into this idea of you can gather data, you can analyze data, you can formulate a solution, and then you can implement the solution. So it's a very linear approach. Oh. So what we can also classify problems as are, um, you can probably take a guess from that picture, that's a data center obviously, um, as messes, okay? So messes are about clusters of interrelated or interdependent problems. And the thing about them is that they can't really be solved in relative isolation to one another. So you can't go in and fix a little bit over here and expect to have nothing happen over there. In fact, you don't know that, and we'll come back to that in a second. So they're more like puzzles, right? So we don't solve them, instead we resolve their complexities. So messes are, of course, a mess, um, clues in the name. And what we do is, so because we can't break them down into parts, we have to uh, look for patterns. Um, if anybody is thinking about software right now, and the term software patterns, um, you, you might see that, there's a re we're not saying that software is a mess, but what we're saying is that, when we create systems that are highly complex, we need to find patterns to help us reason about them, and that's, that's part of what, what the, the pattern movement is addressing. Um, and we have to be very careful that we don't identify the TM problem as a, sorry, a mess as a complex TM problem, because then we'll actually make it worse. Now there's two things that we need to care about with messes. One is the interactive complexity, and one is coupling. So interactive complexity is about understanding what can go wrong. So if you have a mess, so for example, you have a data center full of cables, and you pull out the power plug in one of them, nothing might happen, or the whole thing might go to hell. So Coupling is a little bit different than the coupling you or I are used to, because we're used to coupling in the context of um, coupling in software. What coupling means here is it's the degree to which you cannot stop an impending disaster once it starts. And um, I'll illustrate that um, just to drive the point home. So if we have a, an iceberg and a boat, um, and, and just for the record, I'm from Belfast, so it's okay for me to use the Titanic as an example. Um, the thing is, at which point can we avert disaster? So if it's dark and you can't see and you're steering the ship, it's actually kind of hard, right? See, the point is you don't know. And that's the thing with the mess. You actually don't know what that is. If you knew what it is, it wouldn't be so much of a mess. So another thing to think about to help reason by this, again, interactive complexity and coupling is uh, software and bug fixing. So we have some software. This is a system. Uh, that, that's software, in case you want. And in fact, we we'll refer to this as legacy code. Has anybody here written any legacy code before? No? No, no n neither have I. Um, but I, I heard other people do. So, right, sorry. S spoiler there. So what we'll do, of course, we have this legacy code. What we'll do is we'll get a few, you know, graduates who are a bit, you know, green. 
bit wet behind the ears, and we'll throw them at these bug fixes because that would be a good way for them to learn about the system and what could possibly go wrong. So there we go, they've fixed it. So we now have this green circle at the bottom, so bug's gone. Um, some other stuff here, but no one uses that or tests that, so we don't really care about that. Um, so this is, the point here is that if we actually refactor instead, so if we get our, our experience guys in, so this is about resolving the complexities, we can actually reduce the coupling and we can reduce the interactive complexity. And that's why refactoring now is obviously more effective in systems like software, okay? So this is, this is just to help um, anchor the, the, the concept. So there's a, a final way we can reason about problems, and that is that they can be wicked. So they have wickedness. Um, so they can have, so, so what characterizes wicked problems is that they're based on conflicting ideas from smart informed people, basically. Um, and they're divergent, so there's no promise of a solution. And there's, there, there are constraints that are change over time, and obviously there are many stakeholders and so on. So there's a lot of voices in the room. So it's a bit like having a lot of project managers or something all together in one place, and they're all telling you, uh, you know, how to, how to write your software. It's the same sort of thing. Um, so the key thing about these is that because there's no definitive problem, then there's no definitive solution, right? So by definition. So it means you can't solve them by a linear or a waterfall process. I've actually thrown in the waterfall word there, just as a wee teaser for everyone. Um, so studying followed by taming does not work. Um, there are no stopping rules. Basically, there's a lot of unhappy faces here. I hope you noticed that. And we're finished when we exhaust resources, be it um, exhausting developers, running out of time, whatever it might be. And the solution is not right or wrong. It's either better or worse. And funnily enough, if you make a few poor choices, then you create more wicked problems. So it's a kind of a vicious circle. So if we whiteboard this, um, we can plot behavioral complexity on one axis, dynamic systems complexity on another, and we can draw this little quadrant. Quadrants are brilliant, aren't they? So what we find is that the mother of all um, problems is actually the wicked mess. Okay. And what's interesting is that as you move from low to high, or sorry, from high to low behavioral complexity, you can t and adopt a more scientific solution. And as you move the other way, resolution is more about um, social, ethical, political, moral, whatever, right? Um, so it, it's all the, all the soft skills. Um, and it means that you can also rely on quantitative assessment for progress when you look at the uh, low um, behavioral complexity. But conversely, you need qualitative assessment when you go the other way. Now, what's interesting about this is, of course, is that as you move towards the tame mess, you can take a more managerial or process-driven approach, which is, which is great, right? So someone can tell you how to do the work. But when you go the other way, it's more of a leadership type thing, right? So you're now looking at people to, who really understand and have that intuition for what they're doing to navigate um, the problems. So as we test for everybody, um, do we think that software development has high dynamic systems complexity? Anybody? Yes? No? One? <laughs> Two? <laughs> well, actually, um, I would say that it probably does um, as, as an activity. Why? Because it's actually quite complex. There's lots of different technologies we can adopt, programming languages, and so on and so forth. Does it have high behavioral complexity? Okay, right. Well, yes, it does, right? Um, the reason why, because it's a creative activity. People are involved, it's opinion driven. To a large degree, we try and push standards and etiquette and rules and so on to help people perform, uh, to, to develop in, in smarter ways. But the fact that we have the conferences like these is testament to the fact that there isn't a one right answer to this, right? There's a lot of smart, informed people who are all trying to work on similar problems. Social media is another one, similar. Um, High dynamic systems complexity, not the systems themselves, but the fact that there are many different systems out there, many different channels. And it has very high behavioral complexity because, why? Because again, we have many people involved. Um, and the, 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 the messages that we're getting, the same, same thing said by two different people, exactly the same thing, could mean two very different things. So it's very hard to reason about. And then the classic one is actually trading on the markets. This is, this is almost a perfect example of a wicked mess because we have many systems across the world who are uh, either people and systems who are trading um, various algorithms all competing with each other. So there's a very, very high dynamic system complexity and there's a very high behavioral complexity because it's very opinion driven. Uh, uh, there's lots of people involved and in essence, 
this is the domain, this is the environment in which we are trying to work, right? So we're trying to solve problems in this area. So what we have to appreciate then is that this here will have an influence on what we do. So how do we actually approach wicked problems? Um, so typically, there's no, uh, there are no stopping rules. There's no definitive problem, therefore no definitive solution. We, ex we're, we finish one with exhausted resources, therefore we need a time box. We need a time box, but actually we need to do more than that. We need to iterate because we need to sample. We need to sample and make an assessment of our progress. So we need, obviously, qualitative assessment by expert stakeholders. All very good. So the key thing is getting the right stakeholders in the room. The difference between getting a mob in the room and a, a, a wise crowd, right? This is, this is what we're trying to, trying to get to. So again, things that matter, communication, transparency, and so on, listening and establishing trust. So again, waterfall type solutions um, are too slow to react effectively. And if you scale this on forward, releases of a software would be too slow to react effectively. So for certain classes of problems, when you try to understand them, you actually need a live adapting system, pretty much, right? I mean, this is, this is, this is the thing. And this also should look a little bit like mm, agile development, right? And they use the word waterfall as a clue. So what we're saying is that in general in software, these are things that we try and do um, to improve our chances of success. So what about writing software with hard constraints like performance, right? So this is another thing we want to tackle. So using performance as, a, as an example, there's two things we can do. We can do the current thing better or quicker. This is sometimes referred to as single loop learning. I don't know if you've heard this before. What that means is that you just get better at doing the same thing. You never actually think, you know, maybe I should do something different. Maybe I should do it in a different way. So instead of using a, a, a shovel to dig a hole, you could maybe go and get a digger or pay someone to do it. Um, so you might just, you know, shovel quicker, right? That would, be your, that would be a solution. Or you can achieve the same thing in a different way. So we call this task optimization, right? And the other one we call it algorithmic optimization. So what we want to do here is we want to um, find a way to uh, adopt the algorithmic approach over the task-driven approach. So just to give you a bit of an example, um, and I've actually used algorithms to help with this, um, bubble sort, so no matter how well you implement bubble sort, um, it's typically not going to be as good as uh, on average, something like TimSort, which is the default um, logging, uh, sorry, the default sorting algorithm in Python. Um, and then if you're a signal processing guy, you'll know the difference between a DFT, uh, so a discrete Fourier transform, and a fast Fourier transform. Basic, you know, there are some constraints in using it, but essentially it's, it's better. So the thing that we have to bear in mind is that you want to obviously optimize at the highest level. What's the highest level you can optimize at in software? It's probably the architecture, right? So that's, that, that's the highest level at which you can reason about what you're doing. And um, that's the pretty boxes that the guy in the ivory tower draws, just in case you're not sure. Um, and the fastest way to do something, of course, is not to do it at all. So the higher up that you optimize, the more the less likelihood is that you're going to do unnecessary work further down the stack. So back to the environmental influences again, so we've gone through all this idea of problems and so on. So the architecture for wicked problems is typically a mess, right? So this is something that the reason about, which is why architecture becomes stale over time. So if we can avoid that, that would be a good thing. Um, many stakeholders and an evolving problem domain adds wickedness. Okay, so we've now got a wicked mess. Brilliant. Um, so decomposing and understanding it then becomes complex. So the, the problem is that whether or not you have a good architecture, ultimately you end up with a situation where it's difficult to map your boxes that are drawn and your nice pictures to the actual code that's written. And this pushes us towards task optimization because the only exposure people get is when you're actually in there and you're looking at the code and you see there's a problem, I'll tell you what, I'll fix that. Now obviously we know that we should not optimize without doing analysis, all that kind of stuff. But let's say that that's not the case. Let's say that we just uh, accept that, that by and large that's where we're, we're pushed towards in general. So it becomes hard to make high performing systems without rewriting them from scratch. So again, we want to reason about this but we can only see that, okay? So what we really want is an architecture that is based on, obviously my network's dropped, um, based on well-defined building blocks. Um, it favors algorithmic optimization. It has a clear mapping to code. Allows an optimal solution, obviously. Um, is adapting, adaptive to a changing environment. And, and we refer to this 
um, sort of as a made up term, as an algorithmic architecture. So an architecture that allows us to rearrange or restructure the architecture in such a way that we can come up with a more optimal solution. So we can achieve this by a number of things, and I'm going to run through this very, very quickly. So the, the, the key thing here, the very first thing, and, and if anyone here is into demand-driven design, they might say, no, 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 that's demand-driven design. But actually, what we're saying here is that we want to expose a shared vocabulary. Why? Because we want to be able to talk and reason about our systems in a language that's natural both to us as developers, but also to the business as users of that system. So, and we want it to map to code. So we wanted to be a direct correlation between if I talk about a thing here, there's actually a piece of code there that implements that. It should be decomposable, um, and it should be composable. Decomposable, why? Because at a certain level, you can reason about very high concepts that maybe the business cares about, but as you decompose that, you might be able to realize that, okay, if I want to publish something that's composed of three discrete lower level um, concepts that I need to, to reason about because I'll build those concepts or I'll assemble those together. Composable again so that you can then build complex, larger, more complex systems from that. It should be independently orderable. I don't know if this makes sense to people. What this means is that if it's independently orderable, it means that you do not enforce an ordering that's not required. So for example, um, if you want to uh, achieve concurrency or advantages from, from concurrency, then you need to make sure that if something doesn't, if there's no A happens before B relationship, you don't accidentally put that in your code or in your architecture. And it should be compactable, which means that I can talk about something, for example, I can describe something as a sentence, but there will be redundancy within that description, but that redundancy still exists within my architecture, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't participate in the architecture. In other words, it, you don't pay for it. Um, so it means you can have uh, an actual conversation. And last but not least, it needs to be substitutable. So I guess we all get the duck reference, I hope. Yeah. So duck typing, right? And this is about making your architecture testable and all this kind of stuff. So, okay. So what we want to do is we want to... So Typically what I would say to people is if, you, if you're going to take this approach, how do you start? So you start with something like building block vocabulary elements. What we typically would do, and all the systems I've built using this, we typically have two. We have processors and we have buses. Very, very simple. So processors do stuff with data and buses move data. Pretty straightforward. Now obviously each processor may do something very specific in and of itself, but, but essentially that's what it is at a, a low level. And the interface might look something like this. Again, this is C++, I, I apologize. Um, but you get the idea, right? So you can process, you can push stuff onto your bus, and you can connect your bus and receive. We want to avoid shared state. Anybody who doesn't think that's a good idea, um, I'm nothing to say. Um, <laughs> So we want to favor message, pa message passing, and in fact, this kind of approach requires message passing, right? So that probably should be the first one, but anyway. Um, and we want to make, and this is actually an interesting one, not a lot, lot of people get this, we want to make synchronization points explicit. Why? Because synchronization points are not composable, which means that if you hide them, you run risks of things like live locks, starvation, and so on, right? So you want to make that explicit in your architecture. Now, your, de your composability allows you to make them explicit at different levels in your architecture for sure, right? But you're not hiding them, that's the key point. And the last thing is you want to support push and pull models, and this is about performance because a pull model typically has lower latency, right? So it's deterministic latency, which you may care about. And this could be just a simple policy that you, that you use when you construct. Um, and then you probably want to separate your data and your command paths. Why? Because let's say you want to stop your application running. You've got a queue of five million messages because you had five seconds have passed. Then the only way you're going to be able to do that is you, you, if you push your command message on the end of your queue or you preempt that. So that requires you to synchronize with skills, your performance and so on and so forth. What you need to do is instead is have essentially a double barrel queue. So then you can service your command messages first. So very, very straightforward. And last but not least, if you're using a language that supports static polymorphism, then use static polymorphism. Um, why? Because you get all the benefits you do with dynamic polymorphism without paying for it. So that seems like a good idea to me. So a simple example to just uh, make some of this more clear. If we had, for example, um, a system. So this is, a, this is like a message publishing system in an exchange. 
um, we simply receive data, we check for gaps in the data, we extract messages, we get packets, we process those messages, and then we publish them on out. So we don't do very much. Turns out that we actually don't need some of these things. We don't need these message buses and these process message buses. We, they don't actually really exist, but they exist in the vocabulary, and we may want to have those in the, the system because we may have a reason why they are useful. For example, there may be a thread buyer there that we want to expose, for example. But because we don't need them, we can compact the architecture, and we end up with something a lot simpler. So the last thing we can then do is, of course, we can run it. So if you have a compiled language, again, like um, C++ or any other compiled language, you can compile that down, and you've reduced your abstraction cost. You don't have it anymore. You've got essentially three function calls and two concurrency barriers. So that's very, very simple. So this, is, this, is, this allows you to reason about the system and actually build the system with, with only building what you need and then um, end up with an optimal solution at the end of it. And of course, this allows you to support different performance trade-offs. I'm not going to dwell on this, but essentially, in some cases, you may want uh, to favor throughput over deterministic latency, in which case the one on, on, the, uh, on the left might be better, or the one on the right, which is a pull-based model, would favor and support better latency, but you know, at the cost of, um, at the, at the cost of say, throughput. Um, so again, uh, Th these basic building blocks can be used to give you uh, latency. Sorry, you can have lat you can be latency agnostic or scaling agnostic. So you could scale these across uh, threads, across processors, across machines. It doesn't really matter. The architecture would still hold. That's the key point because you're just using these building blocks and you've just exposed these this vocabulary. And it's a question of how do you implement that. So to show how this maps to code, um, very simple example. Let's say we have the following items, uh, the following components. So we receive packets, we process packets, and then we publish packets. Pretty straightforward. So receive packets might look like this. So simply subscribe code, then we have the inbound packet bus. We're simply pushing, you'll see up here, we're simply pushing the message onto the bus, very, very straightforward. Then to receive packets, we can see that we have the inbound bus, we call process. And again, for each of the components, we simply have the code. So what we're looking at here is the compiler's view of the code. So the compiler sees essentially a single function, but we, we, we write and these live in different modules, right? So we're not, these aren't all written together, necessarily. And then lastly, we publish. So we actually have an architecture that maps directly to code, and it doesn't matter which language you use, the, the principles are the same. So again, code still lives in separate modules, so you can test it, maintain it, all that kind of good stuff. The communication is through the building block interfaces, and the abstraction cross is removed, but the clarity is retained, and that's obviously a key, a key benefit to this. So it's easy, it was, well, nothing is easy to change, fix, or replace, but it's, it is relatively easier to do that, um, because you've got substitutability and so on and so forth. So, bringing it back, to the uh, topic at hand, so algorithmic architecture, real-time AI, and the search for alpha. So if we go back to the original um, system, the original problem we were trying to solve, we were saying, okay, in the case of the, uh, so I'll just display this, the system, we had reasoned about it as this sort of conceptual pipeline. Okay, so this is, this is very good, very straightforward. But what we want to do is we want to reason about this in terms of how would we build this, what would the code actually look like, or what might it look like. So we might instead reason about this in terms of it being software. So again, very similar, we start at the top, we'll have a receiver, we'll have something like a raw message bus. So what's a raw message? A raw message would be if we receive a JSON payload for example, from, from the Partrack API on Twitter. We'd wrap that up with enough information to say, well, when did we receive the message? How big is the message? Um, you know, what, was the, uh, what type of message is it, or whatever? And that's, that's essentially a raw message. We'd push it onto a bus. We'd probably want to save that off um, so we could recover it some future time. We'd have a reader, which would then be able to unpack that information, so it would be aware of that if this message was a PARTRACK API message, therefore I know how to take it out of the raw message envelope and then produce a new message from that which we actually would be able to use and reason about internally within our system. So for example, that might be a message that we would call a social media message. Why would we do that? We would do that because 
let's say we took some messages from StockTwits or um, Facebook, or whatever, we want to come up with a model for how we care about the information that they contain. So what's the, what's the, the text body? How many times has it been reshared? That kind of stuff, right? So we would do that. We would then do some sort of classification because now we, now we know what we're looking at. We can now classify. So we can do some sort of quick analysis. We can you know, look up, oh, is this a message about BMW, for example? And then we'll send it to one of these processors. And what you find is that these processors uh, are actually, so in order to keep this simple, they would actually be a full pipeline themselves of other processors and buses in between that, but I've, I've kept it simple. So there might be some language analysis, um, lexical analysis, and so on and so forth. So, um, as I said, we'll have a simple message in at the bottom. But our goal, of course, at the end is that we'll take all this and we'll then produce it, our own API message at the end, which will tell us um, how, are we, uh, how are we doing with this. So our goal here is we want it to be real time. We want it to be recoverable, quickly recoverable. Why? Because if we want to trade, we can't be out of the market for more than a couple of minutes. Now, it turns out that uh, if you were doing... Um, trading on sort of pure market data, then two minutes would be a very long time. But in the case of what we're doing, that's, we can tolerate something up to about five minute windows. So it's not, it's not too bad. Um, we want it to be adaptive and we want it to be repeatable. So now, here's the sticker. We have many, many processors required because we actually need one of these pipelines here for every either stock plus level, plus whatever. So we literally have thousands of those, okay? So imagine for a second that you're now building this pipeline. We have thousands of these that we now need to manage. That actually starts to be computationally quite intensive. So, as, a, well, as, as the message says, so state and processing time become significant, and I mean, you know, very significant. So... What we have then is we have this problem of all of this state, okay? So, first of all, we have these models that we will build. So, we, we'll, have to, we'll have to do some training for these. We'll have to store them and save them. We'll probably want to adapt these as well. We'll have these lexicons, which again, we'll have to create, store. We'll have to adapt those. And then we have all this state. So, these, this state might include things like a corpus. So, let's say you're doing some language... Uh, analysis, you might keep a corpus of the most frequently, frequent, frequently used terms. That would be a very common um, problem. That corpus could actually become very, very large over time. And so if we want to deal with that, we have to obviously add a bit of memory in. But the other problem is that because of this processing power that's required for each of these pipelines, if we simply just round robin on this here, we need to be certain that the processing time is significantly lower than the expected event rate of when we receive messages. It turns out that it's not. It turns out that the processing time, this actually adds quite a significant amount of latency to the system. So what we need to do is really, and I, I, have, I don't show it in other pictures, but we probably need to introduce some sort of a bus in here that allows us to utilize um, available concurrency on the hardware that we're using, whatever way we want to do that. That obviously causes other issues because now we need to synchronize here before we publish stuff out. But that's okay, we can deal with that. So um, obviously, as I said, with lots of states, so we end up paying for lots of RAM. And when I mean lots of RAM, I actually mean lots and lots of RAM. So for example, the system that we have at the minute, which will do 500 European stocks, probably in flight, uses about 200 gig of RAM um, just to keep itself ticking over. It probably needs more than that, actually. Um, it's just that we haven't been running long enough because what happens is when you start analyzing these state, your pruning algorithms obviously are only so effective and it takes a long time for you to max out the actual uh, sizes of the state that you actually need to, to store. So what about restarts? So if we want to restart the system, how do we do it, right? So the, typically the way you do any sort of message-based system is you shove everything into your recovery store and so, turns green, that's great. So we've got all our messages. So in order to restart, presumably all we need to do is read that store, right? So let's, let's have a think about that for a second. So we get a real message in, we put it in the store, we pass it on down to the reader. We then create our own internal message, which is our social media message, whatever we want to call it. We then 
categorize that. So we've, we've, we've added some information to say, well, what category is this? And we'll come back to that. Goes to a processor. That's all very good. We do a lot of stuff with that. So we pull out a lot of information. And then we have more information that we've now captured about this, this message. It goes on down to the bus. And eventually, we then convert that into our, our API payload, and we send it out. The problem is that that's mutable. And that's, I mean, I, I, I don't know if that's making anybody feel uncomfortable right now, but you really don't want to have mutable messages because now you've entered just a very strong coupling between each of those levels there, which you can't break, right? So the way you, you need to address that, well, the, the way to address this is actually very, very difficult, but the, the point is that the nature of what we're doing is we're actually mutating the messages as we go along, and that's, that, that's a problem. What it means is that this state here, of course, this is delta-based state, so we start off with our trained models and whatever, and all of the state there is derived from the processing of these messages and the additional um, information that is then embedded into those messages. So, of course, the time that it takes to do that is actually quite huge. So the time... Um, I'll give you an example. So to recover from this here, to take this and recover takes about, uh, it's about five, five hours. So obviously if you're trading on this intraday and you have a failure and you need to recover, you're out of the market for a day. That's not acceptable because now you've just lost a lot of money, right? Well, you, you might be lucky, but probably you've lost money because you, you don't know to exit your positions. There's a whole lot of stuff. So that's unacceptable, okay? So as I've said, too slow. So a solution, of course, to this, uh, the obvious one is to, let's, well, let's take a snapshot. Um, so with a snapshot approach, it's very, very simple. We might have something that says, okay, every you know, period of time or so many thousand messages, whatever it might be, whatever we think is a reasonable amount, we'll take a snapshot. So how do we take a snapshot of all of this state? That's actually quite hard to do. Because what we can't do is we can't tell each of these stores to save itself. Because how do we do that? I mean, you remember you've got, you've got thousands of these, okay? So you've thousands of those. You also uh, probably want to run some of these concurrently, right? So now you've got, you've got a synchronization issue. So what you can't do is just say, you know what, every thousand messages, I'm just going to call a big fat stop and everything, and we'll start to then save off this state. So what, what you have to do is you have to then seed messages through your system. So you create, for example, in an ideal world, you'd use something like a variant, okay? So in, and that's conceptually what you would think of. You'd, you'd have a variant message type of which some would be your command messages. This here is based on a real system that wasn't implemented in that way, so that's why I'm, I'm keeping it real as opposed to making stuff up. Um, so they had a special social media message, which actually was a, a command message, which says, okay, take a snapshot. So this message goes through. So, of course, you need a message for every single processor that, that exists. So you need to be aware of all of these, 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 these processors, again, thousands of them. You send this message through. That's great. What happens is the processor then sends the message for each of these elements or components in the pipeline, and then... It, each of those then saves off the state. Now, because that happens in line, as the message leaves and moves on down the stack, we know that that state has been saved. So, of course, we continue to do that through each of these um, uh, components. And then the message pops out onto our social media message bus. And, of course, it does that for everything else, all the other pipelines as well. And then what we have is these all get fed down. And then the snapshot processor, the only problem it needs to worry about is how many of those messages have I received for a given, say, sequence number or whatever that might be. And then when it has that, it can simply then push that into the snapshot and say, okay, that snapshot's now good. Um, and we're done. Now, we're not actually done because if we do that, we can only do a blind recovery. What that means is that we have a snapshot, but we have actually no wonder. We, we, we've got a snapshot and we've got a recovery file which has everything in it. We don't actually have any way, there's no way to communicate back to tell the recovery store that we actually, you know what, we, we don't need some of what you're doing. And of course, our big issue is real time and performance. So what we can't do is we can't interrupt anything. So we can't, we can't sort of have a function call. We can't pass the recovery store down as a, as a reference, for example, um, to the snapshot processor to then interrupt everything because we would then have to synchronize every call to the recovery store. And because every message goes through that, that's not going to work. It's going to be very, very expensive computationally. 
So instead, what we do is we obviously want to work with deltas. And so in this case, we actually start writing a delta file. That's, that's fine. Um, so as soon as we start up, we start writing message. So again, this is your recovery file. And instead, when we want to recover, the recovery processor, or whatever we want to call that, it will do the same thing. It will send the message down and say, OK. So the snapshot manager said, OK, we, we, we now need to, to save off. We, we've, we've been sitting here doing enough work for a while, so let's, let's save this off. So it sends down a message, um, which is great. It goes down through, um, again, saves off the state as before. No problem. All the way down, a snapshot says, yep, I'm good. That's, that's, that's positive. But then what it does, and this is the interesting thing, and this is where the use of buses becomes important, it actually sends a message, a, a, a message up to the raw message bus. Because the bus itself is your synchronization point, right? So in this case, the way it was written previously, maybe it wasn't. But what we're saying is now, let's say that bus is thread safe. Okay, or whatever, whatever. We, so this is some kind of a queue or a bus, whatever we want to call it, that allows us to push information onto it. That's actually okay because it happens at the top of the system. We need some way to marshal it. So it's a bit like your, it's a bit like your message loop. If anyone remembers the old Windows days, um, so what you do is you simply push the message up onto the message bus, and it then comes down, and the recovery processor then says, "Ah, okay, that's fine." So that. That delta file I was working on, I don't need that anymore because I now have a snapshot up to that time. So I just need to keep messages from here on in. So now I start writing a new delta file. And obviously, over time, you then clean up your old ones. You can delete them, but you keep the last one around you know, as a contingency or whatever. And then what you can then say is, OK, so let's assume we've stopped and I've restarted. So now I can read the snapshot. That's great. That's very, very simple. The snapshot then tells me which delta file I need, and it then gets into the raw message bus, which then gets pushed back down. So a recovery is no different to the system as live uh, operation. And that's kind of where you want to get to. Now, what's interesting about this is that you actually have to jump through a few more hoops. This is a very, very standard pattern if anybody's been working in the financial industry, right? This is basically how you do recovery. There, there, there's other ways, but this is basically it. The, the um, what I'm talking about here with the deltas and the snapshots is slightly different because there's a, a bit of extra coupling required. But what it does give us is it gives us our real time, right? So we still have low latency because remember, our message feed is not a very high, it's, it's not a very um, high throughput system, right? So six and a half, you know, peak message rate maximum globally of 150,000 messages a second. It's not very much at all. Um, so it's recoverable, it's recoverable quickly. So this is recoverable now in, say, a couple of minutes because the time, because remember, the processing time for every message is very, very expensive. And we have to do that serially to recover. And this is the problem. So we, it takes us a while to find. A lot of the time in recovery is actually taken to build up the state. Because when you build up state of this size, so that's, the number I quoted was what, 200 gig? Um, of memory, right? To build that up, you're actually using, you're, you're doing memory allocations most of the time. That takes a very long time in most systems. So that's where you spend most of your time. So it's adaptive and it's actually um, repeatable. So, and why it's repeatable is because if we want to test this, now we can use the same approach. We can, we can actually have preloaded delta files. We can use it for test data, all this kind of stuff. Because we'll always end up with the same, we can load our models in, but we can always end up with the same adaptive models and so on. The other way, it just takes too long, we can't do it. It literally takes, you know, if we were to do like a full training um, session and uh, to, to build up the initial models and then do a recovery, it takes, you know, it can take a couple of days to do that. So, bit of a wind it up now. Um, so, how have we, has this been successful or not, I guess is, is the point. So, for, for getting uh, for a second recovery and so on, in terms of trading, uh, we did some analysis for March um, of this year. And we were able, and this, this actually was mirrored consistently through every month of the year. We could we could uh, attain profits of three to six percent a month, which is actually, uh, if you're into trading, that's that's huge, right? And a sharp ratio of eleven plus, which actually looks ridiculously high to the point where you would think maybe you've made a mistake. The point is that there is a lot of actually useful information in social media. But a lot of it is not about the opinion of what somebody said. It's about how the information moves within social media. And because of that, this is why there's an interest in actually getting this stuff right um, and trying to build these systems. And 
because there's so much opportunity here, it's actually cheap to buy lots of RAM and throw it at this problem because RAM's cheaper than developers. And if we can get the recovery right and so on, we can actually trade on this and, and you can make a significant amount of money. So we're actually going to go live within the next two months um, trading on our own account in this. So if you never hear from me again, it's because it actually failed miserably. But otherwise, we, we can assume that you know, the, the testing that we've done, which is dummy trading, has actually been very, very fruitful. So um, thanks very much, everyone, for, for attending.